really great job this week watching and taking notes on and learning from those AP review videos. What I want to do today is kind of quickly go through all of the material you've seen so far, but the parts I really care about you knowing. There are details that are in those videos that are beyond the scope of what we're covering in this class. So, um, for starters, let's talk about how we measure. Well, before we do that, let's remember acids and bases, okay? Acids and bases. And the definition that we're going to use for this class is the bronsted level. Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases describes them in terms of proton transfer. Where when we say proton, we mean an H+, a hydrogen atom with its electron removed. So proton transfer um, is how we think about Bronsted-Lowry. An acid is a proton donor, a base is a proton acceptor. This is not wildly different from the Arrhenius definition, which has to do with H plus and hydroxide ions that are created by dissociation, um, but it's a little bit broader and a little bit more useful. So the acid, the, the substance that we encounter the most, which can act as either a Bronsted-Lowry acid or a Bronsted-Lowry base, is water. Water can act as a proton donor, when water acts as a proton donor, it gives up that H plus to something else um, and then creates OH minus. Water can also act as a proton acceptor to create hydronium. So the top reaction has water acting as an acid, the bottom reaction has water acting as a base. It's worth pointing out that, generally speaking, we need to have both an acid and a base in a reaction. Um, and so this is more an example of how this could happen as opposed to a true acid-base reaction. When we have H plus in water, this reaction happens. What's actually in water is going to be H3O plus. But for simplicity, we pretend like it's just H plus. Um, if you go far enough along in chemistry, it may at some point matter that water is in the form of hydronium instead of H plus. Different teachers and different professors care more and less about this. We're going to just use H+, because it makes the math a little bit simpler. All right, so if water can act as both an acid and a base, then it stands to reason that water can act as an acid and a base in its own reaction. One water molecule can transfer a proton to another water molecule. I'm going to put my equilibrium arrows here instead of my single arrow that describes a reaction because this reaction isn't going to happen very much. One of the water molecules will accept a proton. That one acted as a base and becomes hydronium. The other will donate a proton. It's acting as an acid and what's left over is the hydroxide ion. So this happens all the time. If you have a glass of water, this equilibrium is happening in the solution, but it's not happening very much. If I go through and put the states on this, which I really should have been doing from the beginning, then I can write an equilibrium expression for this reaction. K is going to be equal to products divided by reactants, but what do you notice about both of my reactants? They're pure substances, so they're not going to appear in the equilibrium expression. So my K value is just going to be the concentration of H3O plus to the first power times the concentration of OH minus, again, to the first power. And like I said earlier, we're going to pretend like this H3O plus is just free protons in water. So the K for this reaction is going to be equal to the concentration of H plus times the concentration of OH minus at 25 degrees Celsius. This KW value equals 1 times 10 to the minus 14th. And I called it KW. Let's start labeling it with that letter here. I told you when we talked about equilibrium that there are lots of different K values for lots of different reactions. And we give them subscript to help keep them straight. The K for this reaction is called KW. It's, the wa it's water's dissociation constant. All right. This at 25 degrees Celsius, the AP videos talk a fair amount about that. 
it should have made sense to you in terms of our discussions of equilibrium and Le Chatelier's principle, but we are only going to solve problems at 25 degrees Celsius. We are not going to worry about how this reaction changes with temperature. So that's a thing that we cannot worry about too much. Okay, so this, it turns out, is an incredibly useful and incredibly powerful equation or system that we have set up here. The, the amount or the concentration of H plus in any water solution times the concentration of OH minus always has to equal this number. What that means is that as the H plus concentration increases, the OH minus concentration has to decrease. And as the H plus concentration decreases, the OH minus concentration has to increase. But they're always going to be tied to each other. Also, this means that if you know one of these two numbers, you can calculate the other one because you know that when you multiply them together, they always have to equal 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Let's start by assuming we have a neutral solution. The definition of a neutral solution is one where the concentration of H plus is equal to the concentration of OH minus. A solution is not neutral because it has no acids and no bases. A solution is neutral because it has the same number of acids and bases. In the same way that a substance is neutrally charged when it has, or an atom is neutrally charged when it has the same number of protons and electrons. So if we have a neutral solution and these two are equal to each other, then one point, or just one, times 10 to the minus 14th is going to be equal to, if we're looking for what these concentrations are, we can make one of them x, and then the other one will also be x. So the concentration of H plus is equal to the concentration of OH minus is equal to the square root of 1 times 10 to the minus 14th, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. When a solution is neutral and the H plus and OH minus concentrations are equal to each other, both of those concentrations are equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 7. Then we should probably go ahead and put a molar out here. We've seen before in equilibrium, we tend to play pretty fast and loose with the units on molarity. Um, and that has to do with the difference between concentration and activity, which is way beyond the scope of this course. Uh, but we'll put the molarity back in there. The concentration of H plus and of OH minus in solution varies wildly. Um, and as a result, we don't talk about it in terms of the concentration, we talk about it in terms of the negative log of the concentration. We're going to define the pH of a solution to be equal to the minus log of the concentration of H+. Plus. That's an equation you should have seen before. That's an equation you hopefully may have used before. The one that you might not have seen before you started watching the videos this week is the pOH. The pOH is minus the log of the concentration of hydroxide. I mean, it seems it makes sense. This P in front um, means the same thing for both of them. Sometimes it's defined as the power of. Um, I don't know that that's actually a mathematical term. Um, at any rate, so if we take these neutral solutions and we plug in the concentration of H plus of 1 times 10 to the minus 7, the pH of this solution, go ahead and put that into a calculator. We're, we're trying to figure out what minus the log of, the co of 1 times 10 to the minus 7 is. So 1 times 10 to the minus 7. Oh, I've done that backwards. You're going to have to figure out with your calculator which you put in first. Do you put in the log first or do you put in the number? When I take the log of 1 times 10 to the minus 7th, I get minus 7, which if we remembered how logs work, we wouldn't have needed a calculator for, but you might have. And then when we flip the sign with that negative sign, we get a pH of 7, which is what we thought we were supposed to get. We get a pH of 7, and we also get a pOH of 7. So these are sort of the four criteria that tell us we have a neutral solution at 25 degrees Celsius. It's a little like backwards Florida. Oklahoma. Looks like Oklahoma. All right, there we go. Uh, that's our uh, secret question. What state shape did I sort of almost draw on the board? See, now I'm getting... whatever. Oklahoma. Um, any of these four things, although I'm not going to give you a viewing quiz on this. I'm just going to ramble here for a second. Also, there seems to be a spider web in my house. Whatever. This is what you get. It's early in the morning. 
All right, let's find a different solution then. Let's take an acidic solution. You hopefully remember from previous classes that an acidic solution is one with a low pH. So let's just say our acidic solution has a pH of three. Let's just pick a whole number to make the math easy. This is definitely an acid. Its pH is less than seven. Let me erase these guys over here. This is one way to describe the pH of the solution. Another way to describe, or not the pH, but the acidity of the solution. Another way is to give the concentration of H+. To do that, we've got to rearrange this equation to solve for H plus concentration. And when we do that, we find that the concentration of H plus is always going to be equal to 10 raised to the minus pH power. And the concentration of hydroxide, by the same token, is going to be 10 raised to the minus pOH power. So if our solution has a pH of 3, its concentration of H plus is going to be 1 times 10 to the negative 3. This concentration of H plus is bigger than 1 times 10 to the minus 7, which also tells us that the solution is acidic. What about the H, the OH minus then? I told you that there was an important relationship between H plus and OH minus, and that's the KW. KW equals H plus times OH minus, and it equals 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So 1 times 10 to the minus 14 is going to equal our H plus concentration, which is 1 times 10 to the minus third, times our OH minus concentration. We're going to divide both sides, or if you remember about how exponents work, you can just subtract those exponents, and we're going to get an OH minus concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 11. This OH minus concentration is lower than it would be in a neutral solution. In a neutral solution, it would be 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So again, we see that this solution is acidic. All right, we found the pH, we found the H plus, we found the OH minus. The last way to define this, the pH of a solution, or the acidity of a solution, is with the pOH. To find the pOH, we take the minus log of the OH minus concentration, and that gives us a pH for the solution of 11. The pOH and the pH are going to have kind of opposite conventions when it comes to what numbers mean acidic and basic. When the pOH is greater than 7, it's an acidic solution. When the pH is less than 7, it's an acidic solution. I want you to notice something else. When I add this pH value and this pOH value, I get 14. And this will always be true. We can, do, we can take minus the log of both sides of the KW expression to get this. Um, so if you want to do that, I will leave that as an exercise for the viewer. When it comes to the equations we're going to need, those four are really just two equations and then a rearrangement of the two equations. And then those two. Those are the equations that we're going to need to describe whether a solution is acidic or basic and rearrange between the different ways of defining its acidity and basicity. Okay? All right. So let's start talking about finding the pH of actual solutions. If you're feeling a little overwhelmed with this, this is a good time to pause and take a break. Um, we're shifting gears just a little bit. So if you need to, take a minute, clear your head. I'm a big believer in going for a short walk or just getting away from your computer for a minute. Or if everything is making sense and you're happy, then just keep on keeping on. There are several different ways to talk about pHs of different solutions. Um, and I'm going to simplify this a little bit for us because we're in sort of a weird situation with this, um, with this online learning. Um, so we're going to learn to find the pHs of some different kinds of solutions. We're going to start by learning to find the pHs of strong acid and base solutions. Alright, the first thing we're going to have to be able to do is identify a solution as being a strong acid or a strong base solution. What are our six strong acids? This is a list we've just got to have memorized or written down somewhere. 
HCl, HBr, HI. Nitric, sulfuric, perchloric. What that means is that these are the only six acids that we're going to consider to be strong, and any other acid we will consider to be weak. Our strong bases are anything with hydroxide. Our hydroxide salts are going to be our strong bases. And we're going to assume that they dissociate completely. The ones that I give you will dissociate completely, will both dissolve and dissociate completely. So this word strong means, as I just said, dissociates completely. What that means is that when we're talking about an acid, the concentration of any strong acid is just going to be equal to the concentration of H plus in solution. So how will we find the pH? We'll just take minus the log of that. If I have a 0.2 molar solution of HBr, how do I find the pH of this solution? The first thing I have to do is identify this as being a strong acid. It is a strong acid because it's on our list. So then the concentration of H plus in this solution is also equal to 0.2 molar. And the pH of this solution is going to be minus the log of 0.2. I'm going to grab a calculator for this. I have to turn on. Minus the log of 0.2 gives me a pH of 0 0.70. It's worth noting here, pHs can be less than 1, pHs can even be negative. So that makes sense. This was a strong acid solution. We would expect the pH to be less than 7, and it's a lot less than 7. And that's all we have to do to find the pH of a strong acid solution. The only thing that's tricky about this is that this only works if we have a strong acid. This only works if we have one of these six. So what about a strong base? In a strong base solution, the concentration of hydroxide ion is what we're looking for. We have to be a little bit careful here. For the most part, the concentration of the base is going to be equal to the concentration of the hydroxide. So if I have 0.075 molar KOH, then the concentration of hydroxide is equal to 0.075 molar. Now there are two different ways to find the pH from the concentration of hydroxide. We can use the KW expression to change that concentration of hydroxide into concentration of H+, and then from that we can get the pH. But my preference is to find the pOH from the concentration of hydroxide. So this pOH is equal to 1.12. And then how do we find pH from pOH? We just subtract from 14. And I get 12.88. A pH of 12.88 makes a lot of sense for a strong base. We would expect it to be a very high pH, pretty close to 14, and sure enough it is. So the first thing that makes base pHs a little bit trickier is that we usually have to do an extra step of math here, or we always have to do an extra step of math if what we're looking for is pH. Um, you should pay attention to the questions. It's possible that a base problem could ask you for pOH instead of pH, and then you wouldn't have to do this. The other thing that could make this trickier is let's say I have a 1.3 times 10 to the minus 4 molar solution of calcium hydroxide. What's tricky about calcium hydroxide? Yeah, it's that subscript 2. It's the fact that each calcium hydroxide has two hydroxide ions. So the concentration of OH minus... Every time one of those calcium hydroxide formula ligaments dissociates in water, it's going to create two hydroxide ions. The concentration of hydroxide is going to be two times the concentration of the substance. 
So the concentration of hydroxide is 2.6 times 10 to the minus 4, which is going to give us a pOH of 2.6. Nine and a pH of ten point four one. Okay, so strong acids and strong base solutions are relatively easy to find the pHs of. Um, bases are a titch more complicated because there's a little bit of extra math at the end, and because sometimes you end up with two OH minuses. Strong acids are pretty easy. Okay, so the last thing I want us to do today is I want us to talk about weak acids. For our weak acid, let's take vinegar. formula is HC2H3O2. So when we put acetic acid in water, if it's an acid, it must be creating some H+. It must be, well, actually, let's draw this as a reaction with the water. I'd rather have an acid and a base on the left-hand side of this equation. When aqueous vinegar reacts with water, it's going to act as an acid. It's going to act as an acid in the bronsted lowry sense, and it's going to donate a proton to the water, which is going to turn the water into H3O+, and leave the acetate ion behind. But I've drawn the equilibrium arrows here. The fact that this is a weak acid means that this reaction does not go to completion. This reaction reaches some sort of equilibrium. And when we have the equilibrium arrows, we know that we can write a K expression. Which of these things will not appear in the K expression? Yeah, it's the water. The water doesn't appear because it's a pure liquid. So our K expression here is going to be concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of the acetate ion divided by the concentration of the acetic acid. And this K gets its own subscript. This K is a Ka value. It's an acid dissociation constant. So every weak acid will have a K value, and we can find them in tables. And just as I said with the water, we're only going to worry about these solutions at 25 degrees Celsius. So this substance's K is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. You will be always be provided with all of the Ka values that you need. You shouldn't worry about ever having to memorize any of these. So that K is much less than, which tells us that this reaction is reactant favored, which we thought it was going to be because we said that it was a weak acid. So what can we do with this K value? What we can do with this K value is use it and the equation to find the pH of a weak acid solution. I'm going to write this over here. The Ka value tells us also about the relative strength of weak acids. The more those acids dissociate, the larger the K value will be because the more H3O plus and of the, the conjugate base will create. All right, if I want to know the pH of a solution, and let's say that I start with a 0 0.30 molar solution of vinegar, and I want to know what its pH is. It might be a good idea to get in the habit of making a prediction. This is an acid solution, so the pH is going to have to be less than 7. But it's a weak acid solution, so we're going to be surprised if that pH is less than 2. Usually pHs less than 2 are reserved for strong acids. 
It's not impossible to have a very high concentration of a relatively strong weak acid, but it would be rare. So since we have a weak acid solution, this is kind of what we're expecting. And when we make predictions like this, it'll let us check our work at the end to see if we actually have the correct concentrations or the correct pHs. All right, so we're going to draw an ice table. I don't like the rice tables. I'm not adding the I, the R at the top. I'm just going to keep on calling them ice. All right. One substance doesn't appear in the ice table, just as it didn't appear in the equilibrium expression, and that's going to be the water. What is our initial, well, what kinds of numbers go into our ice table? Concentration values. Concentrations go into our ice table. The initial concentration of this acid is 0 0.30, so we'll go ahead and put that in here. We're going to assume that the initial concentrations of the H3O plus and of the acetate ion are both zero. You may know, and I hope that you remember from, I don't know, 10 minutes ago, that there is some H3O plus in pure water. So there is already a concentration of H3O plus, but it's 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And that's small enough that we can pretend like it starts at zero. Which way will this reaction have to shift to reach equilibrium? It's got to shift towards the right because we have no products. Since we shift towards the right, our x on the left-hand side is negative, and both of our x's on the right-hand side are positive. The ratio from the equation is 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, so the ratio in the change row is 1 to 1 to 1. So our equilibrium amount of acetic acid is 0 0.30 minus x. Our equilibrium amount of H3O plus is x, and of acetate is x. Now we can use our Ka value. Our Ka expression is going to be concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of acetate, which will be x squared, divided by 0 0.30 minus x. Now, we could solve this. We can set this equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 5th, um, and we can multiply both sides. We can get our terms all together and use the quadratic equation to solve this. But we can also assume that because this is a weak acid, because the K value is so small, it is probably true that 0 0.30 minus x is basically the same as 0 0.30. We talked about this when we did just equilibrium problems. At the end, we'll check and make sure that x is less than 5%, and if that's the case, then this, then this assumption will hold. So in that case, we can replace this x squared over... 0.3 equals 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So I'm going to multiply 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 times 0.3, and then I'm going to take the square root of that number, and I'm going to get x to be equal to 0.0023. So 0 0.0023 is what I get for x. Now, what was x? x was the equilibrium concentration of H3O plus and the equilibrium concentration of acetate. So I'm going to go ahead and write those up here. I also need to take a second and check and be sure that my 5% rule assumption was fair. I'm going to divide this by the initial concentration, which is 0.3. I'm going to multiply by 100 to turn that into a percent. And what I get is that this solution is 0.77% ionized, which is less than 5%, so this assumption holds. So we're almost to the end. The answer, the question we're trying to answer at the beginning was what is the pH of this solution? And to find the pH of this solution, we're going to take this hydronium ion concentration and take minus the log of it. Remember that we'll use H3O plus and H plus interchangeably. So minus the log of that answer gives me a pH of 2.6. Now, 2.63. Let's go ahead and give those six six there. Okay. Is that reasonable with our assumption? It is. It's greater than, it's less than 7, which we knew it was going to be. It's greater than 2, not by a lot, 
But 0.3 molar is a relatively high concentration for the problems that we're going to solve. And it turns out that 1 times 10 to the 5th is actually a pretty strong weak acid. All right, I think this is good for now. My plan for today is that you guys will watch this video at some point this morning, and then at 2 o'clock we'll have a Zoom class. I'm going to post your uh, UT Quest problems as well, um, and I'll be able to answer your questions then. Um, we'll do a Zoom at 2 both today and tomorrow to ask some questions and for you to work on some UT Quest problems. At some point I'll either post a video or in the Zoom I'll talk about how we do this with weak bases, but I think this is enough for you guys for right now. All right.